All right. Well, it is actually the top of the hour, so I should begin. Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. Uh, we have a couple of splendid guests, and we have uh, a really, really important book that I'm really looking forward to diving into. These are two awesome people. Um, Laura uh, Chernowicz and uh, Catherine Cronin are coming to us from years spent in the education and technology space, doing a lot of really thoughtful and creative work. Um, they also the, are the authors of a brand new book called Higher Education for Good. If you look in the bottom left of the screen, you can see a tan colored box with a link to it. And this is a collection that they edited and wrote some in, uh, which takes a look at reimagining higher education in terms of increasing its social purpose for actually doing good in the world. What does this mean? How do we actually make social, sorry, how do we actually make higher education do better in the world? So to begin with, Let's bring them up on stage, and then they can tell us what this is all about. So to begin with, we have Laura. Hello, Laura. Hi, Brian. It's great to see you again. And hello to people I know who are here, and hello to the people I don't know who are here. It's great to be Bravo. here. It's great to be talking about the book. Just to correct you before we even get going, Brian, we are not the authors of this book. We are the editors of this book and the authors of the first chapter. There I'm are sorry, a lot of authors. There are so many authors. Some of them are with us today. And um, we hope they're going to be speaking as well. My apologies. So, I meant to say No, 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 no. Let's, let's just acknowledge them all. That's, it's Absolutely. a great pleasure. It's Absolutely. a great pleasure and, to be here. And where, where are you today? Or this evening, I right? am in Cape Town. It's nighttime. It's hot. It's been over thirty degrees today. Uh, oh Celsius. my gosh! Yep. Um, it's all good. Well, stay cool. Um, and, and speaking of being cool, um, you know, on, on the forum we have a tradition of introducing people by um, asking them what they're working on in the future. Uh, what, what does the next year hold for you? What are the big topics and the big projects for you? So, Brian, I'm going to start by telling you what I'm not going to do. <laughs> well, okay, what are you not going to do? Uh, what I'm not going to do is lead big research projects. I'm not going to be running centers. I'm probably not going to be first authors on any books, uh, on any book chapters. I am um, at the point in a very strange higher education system where it's very rare to have a a permanent position, and we have a, a formal retirement age, so I've had to retire, and I'm very mindful of the precariousness of most academics' lives nowadays, and I think it's really incumbent on me to, to take a step back and actually give people a lot more space because there's much less space to be had. Mm. Um, the other thing that I'm, I, I want to say is I'm going to stop making sense. And by that, I don't mean the um, the I, I don't mean to get my my give my age away here, but I don't mean the the talking heads concept. I I'm heard not it. Going to, I heard I'm it. not I'm not going to stop making sense. I mean, I'm going to continue as much as possible with sense making, because I think we're in a very confusing period and one that is often explicitly obfuscated. And I think it's incumbent upon as many of us as possible to do as much sense making as possible. So that's really what I'm hoping to focus on. I think that's enough for now. There's lots more to say, but Catherine has um, things to say to you. Well, I'm glad to hear from both of you. And I'm very impressed uh, at this next stage of your career. And as always, I'm looking forward to learning from you. Um, so let me bring up Catherine, your colleague, and uh, let's see. And co-editor of this volume and here we go hello catherine hello from galway in ireland <laughs> oh excellent I mean, we have a whole series of time zones represented here not to mention a bunch of uh, uh nations um how is galway tonight galway is a bit wet and wild and it has been really stormy for the week um it's above freezing but not very much above freezing so it's not the oh. nicest time of year here, but it's um, still lovely, even when it's wild. And although I'm from, I live in Galway, I've been here half my life. I was born in the Bronx, and I know, I know there's another person here from the Bronx. So shout out to the Bronx. 
<laughs> yeah, I hear that. Hi, Stacy. <laughs> native New Yorker here, so glad to hear it. Um, what are you going to be working on for the next year, Catherine? Are you going to be adding books to that uh, lovely bookshelf behind you? My my pandemic project, the bookshelf. Um, I, I, as Laura and I may say more than once during this hour, the this book project was more than producing a book for us. You know, it was it was definitely a passion project. You know, that started out in deep conversations and. Um, consisted of deep conversations all the way through. So it's really lovely to be here tonight, for example. Um, we're, we're doing some more online events, some in-person events, really trying to dig in and have deeper conversations around a lot of the ideas in the book. There are so many, there's 27 chapters in the book. There's so much work there. So definitely continuing some of those threads. Um, yeah. And I've been working independently, a little bit like Laura. I work left full time um, institutional employment two years ago. I'm, I'm working nearly full-time independently now. Um, cool. But I've been able to create a much different mix in my life, which has been really rewarding. So um, I last year I worked with community groups who you know, very quickly put a lot of their materials online during the pan pandemic, but didn't know much about digital or open licensing or permissions or all those kinds of things. So, you know, just working with people who are have so few resources and are really passionate and doing wonderful work um, and kind of, you know, engaging in dialogue, sharing what I know, learning what they're doing. So a little bit more of that as well. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, that sounds like a terrific year ahead. I'm, I'm so glad to hear it. Uh, here, let me actually just rearrange the screen a little bit so that we're all uh, lined up. Okay. Uh, we have a quick question actually um, from uh, one of our uh, really, really deep diving research minded um, audience members, that's Glenn McGee. And he asks this question, actually, this is before we even get to your book. He says, uh, Ireland and Cape Town, do they use the credit hour system in higher ed? And if so, when did that start? This is how incredibly um, deep minded our audience is. We, we dive deep. Um, I'll answer for Ireland uses a European wide system, uh, ECTs, which is, mm -hmm. I suppose, equivalent to credit hours, but it's not measured in hours, um, mm -hmm. which I know can be a, a tension uh, in many systems that still use credit hours. So every course or what's called a module here in Ireland would have a set number of, of ECTs or credits and you accrue those to get various levels of um, qualifications. Thank you. Thank you. That's fascinating. And uh, no, not not in that way here in South Africa. So of course that makes me want to say, tell me more, but that's not our job today. <laughs> well, well, first of all, uh, Glenn, that was a good technical question, and Laura and Catherine, thank you for those for those answers. Um, so, by the way, that's an example. If you're new to the forum, that's an example of a Q and A question. Uh, so, if you want to follow Glenn and ask questions like that, just go to the bottom of the screen. We'll cross that white strip and find the question mark button and you can type in your own question. Uh, the question I wanted to ask the two of you is this lush book, which has so many ideas and so many people working on this, and some of them are here right now. I'm, I'm curious, in the process of seeing it from inception to publication, what are some of the ideas um, that surprised you? You're smiling, Laura. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm waiting to hear what you're going to say. <laughs> um, my brain is sparking. There were many surprises, and some of them were not in the content of the book, but rather mm -hmm. in the process mm -hmm. of the book. Um, mm -hmm. It was a really difficult time to send out an invitation to write proposals for chapters for a book. I mean, we, we sent out that invitation for proposals in December 2021. We were still in the really difficult days of the pandemic and um, we received almost 100 proposals, which astonished us. Um, and a few people had to drop out, but there was, you know, we were committed to this, but what we what surprised us was how much of a commitment there was from so many different authors and artists who felt they had something to say, even though things 
were so difficult, you know, in their institutions, in their settings, and and continue to be difficult, you know, through the process of writing and reviewing. You know, we we were in close contact with authors all the way through. So we we built what we called a community of authors and reviewers and us as editors, and um, everyone really supported one another, you know, in the what we called a critical and caring way. So that was beautiful and surprising, and I hope that you know, the quality of, of the book itself, I think the quality of the book itself certainly reflects that, um, you know, that kind of openness and caring and so on. So, I mean, I could talk about the content as well, but um, maybe I'll, I'll hand over to you, Laura, to see what you think. I think what surprised me was, as Catherine said, we, we put out this call at a really difficult time. The pandemic wasn't really over. Um, in South Africa, there had been streams of student protests. In other parts of the world, there had been academic strikes. Um, people were worn out. They were exhausted. And so to put out a call that says, speak to the question of good, not only required people to think about good, but to, it, to put the energy into sharing those ideas. And um, we had so many proposals. We had far more proposals than we were able to use. Wow. And Far, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a volume two for us to hand the baton over to someone else to do, but um, it was it was a surprise in a really good way how much people were doing. A lot of people were quite tentative. It was like my my piece of good isn't really original, or my piece of good is is only halfway there, or whatever. But of course, uh, uh, having read the the chapters, you'll know that that's not all. You know, people are cautious. But I, I, that was a really happy surprise how much good work is being done despite, 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 despite. And we know what all the despites are. You know, the despites are the really difficult circumstances most academics in most places find themselves in. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's a lovely, lovely set of surprises. Um, all the human care and all of this willingness to, to devote scant resources to envision a better future for higher education and uh, a better higher education for the world oh those are wonderful surprises to have i mean this I, I, this might be this might be a good moment to ask one or two of the authors who are here yeah um, yeah, yeah um well here let me just do this um if um uh, if any of the authors that i can see robin de rosa there wants to join us on stage um just click that teal color podium uh, and the minute you click that, you'll be transported up on stage next to all of us. And you don't have to have a bookshelf, a lot of stuff behind it, but you do have to have a wonderful brain. Hello, Robin. Hey, can you actually hear me? Am I unmuted and everything? I can yes. hear you fine. Yes. <laughs> I didn't really plan on this. I was just eating my lunch, but uh, I'm sure there there's some invocation here since uh, my chapter is towards the front of the book and it it really does, um, as my amazing colleagues and friends are talking about, it really does start from, a, in some ways, a place of darkness um, because I teach at a regional uh, public university in a rural area of the United States. And we are eyeball deep in um, scarcity and austerity and demoralization and devaluation of the of the learning process um and at first i i think i even reached out to these guys i've i've known them through open education for a long time and said um you know i really want to be part of this but i the truths that i deal with every single day in my job i direct a, a library now and a teaching and learning center are very very distressing but I don't feel like I can, I, I, I also get a lot of spin um, and I don't feel like I can write about hope unless I go into the darkness because otherwise I'm just gonna feel like a spin doctor. Um, mm -hmm. So I appreciated that they, and that they chose to put my chapter at the front, I mm -hmm. thought was really a way of saying to academics, look, if you are in a dire place um, don't be afraid to read about hope because we are going to acknowledge first the very difficult conditions, which I think are both labor conditions that are so 
toxically difficult for so many people right now. And then there are also learning conditions um, for our students and ourselves as scholars and researchers. Um, so most of my chapter really lays out um, those conditions through the lens of neoliberalism and in the research that I did for the book, um, which has such a global lens, um, I was really pushed to see whether my experience in the United States, in what ways it was similar and different from experiences in other places, and um, really found a lot of, of common and distressing themes that, that did center around um, the privatization and marketization of, of learning in ways that have been distressing, I think, for higher ed. So I just want to thank them for taking a really realistic look at the picture. And then the folks who follow me find hope that I think is very much rooted in the, the realities of the challenges that we're facing. Oh, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Thanks, Robin. I, I was so just happy to see you in that first chapter to say, ah, oh, that's amazing. That's great. Um, and, and before I could even say anything more, Jim Luke just joined us, another author from your book. Hello, Jim. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I just want to mention uh, it, was, <clears throat> it was a fantastic experience. And I, there's so many aspects to talk about. It was a very difficult period for me as well, personally, health-wise, professionally. Uh, career-wise, in addition to, you know, all the background of the pandemic and stuff like that going on. Um, but I also have to uh, tell everybody, if you have a chance to work with Catherine or Laura, or if particular Laura walks up to you like she did at a conference to me in Galway about four or five years ago and says to you, this is very important work and you, we have to do research on this and you have to do it. Um, when she says that, you pretty much have to follow. But what I liked about this was part of the experience was, it's cliche to say walk the talk, but for example, in the process of creating the book, which was in effect, I think, I, think, I don't think any of us thought we know what is higher ed we were all kind of continuing, you know, hesitant about doing it, but the process of trying to write it and work with each other and the process of forming the community uh, mm. and having these conversations, like I'm remembering a, a long conversation was supposed to be peer review that I had with Kate Bowles at one point and I came away with it. And afterwards I'm thinking, oh, this is, the kind of network uh, polycentric governance I wrote about, we need to have kind of an open commons structure, which involves polycentric uh, stuff and all kinds of abstract stuff that economists talk about. And I'm going, oh no, this is actually it. So we're actually doing it. Um, and we're modeling it at the same time as we're actually learning it ourselves. And I'm realizing, yeah, that's what higher ed is great at. That's what it's about anywhere. It's about everybody in the society learning more about what we do. And what it's not about is just, you know, workforce development uh, for some sort of, you know, other that already has too much. So anyway, it was, it was just a fantastic experience. Um, I know I'm inspired. I know what I'm doing post retirement is I'm going to be doing more writing and oh. talking about this stuff. So, oh, good. And so get it today. <laughs> <laughs> Easy to do. Easy to do. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Can, can I keep you up here for another minute more? Sure, sure. Sure. Um, well, I rarely I leave the stage voluntarily. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good to know says the man with the power um so, uh, well it sounds like um catherine and laura that you've assembled a wonderful community of people um to do a lot of really solid work together um 
we have another person to join us. Uh, let me see if I can bring her up. Uh, this is Carolyn. And I think her camera is off. Carolyn. Hey. Oh, there you are. Can you hear me? <clears throat> Here yes. is you. Hello. Hi. I just don't know how to jump into the podium, but I just raised my hand and it seemed it worked. I was I, I saw that and I complied. <laughs> Yeah, I, I want to, I'm, I'm a co-author, I wrote a chapter with two more colleagues and, and I think that one of the really wonderful things and rare combinations, if I may say, is, you know, I think Kathy and Laura are very, um, very good scholars, very high standard scholars, so there is, um, you have to work hard to achieve that standard in a way. But then at the same time, um, there is this very other human side of it. So in the process of writing, editing, also, you know, you need to agree with the editor if that's the idea they have, like all of that. I think they are very um, hairy, very, without being compromising or without, you know, under, I don't know how to say it, but it's this really two things working together. You are, in a way, through them driving to my standard, but at the same time, they care so that you go up to that standard. And I find that in a very friendly environment, which I don't think is always the case. And I really think, and I don't know, but I can imagine that they have invested a lot of the time to do this. Because it's you have you know it requires time, it requires patience, it requires writing email and another email and then and so and reading and really with attention to detail and saying you know I think I find that reading really wonderful. I'm quite new to academia. Well, rather, I'm not you know I'm early career research, mm -hmm. although um, I'm not 25, but it doesn't matter. Um, and I think that that really made us all work and enjoy nevertheless you know the time the difficulties the charity whatever it's happened before that in society but i think it wasn't just a space of the care of joy of learning of flourishing of growing and i don't think that happens all the time and i am very grateful for that. Brian, can I can I answer those those very kind words, please? Absolutely, you would raise your hand. Just jump in. <laughs> okay, no, well, Catherine might want to say something too. Ca Carolyn, here? thanks, thanks so much for what you've said, and I I would like mm -hmm. to just say that it's not just um, us as individuals; mm -hmm. it's actually where we are in our careers, mm -hmm. and there's something about being a senior person in the system that gives mm -hmm. you freedom that you don't have when you're, you said, an emerging, a junior, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever. And when mm -hmm. I was the director of the uh, Center for Teaching and Learning, we found that the people who were, who were most free to innovate were either the very new people who mm -hmm. hadn't yet been sucked into the system or the full professors, the most senior people mm -hmm. who actually were at the point they didn't have to prove anything. Mm -hmm. And the terrible thing about academia now is that people are just caught mm -hmm. in this rat race of pressures mm -hmm. and metri met metrices and um, hoops that they have to jump through. And, and in fact, it astonishes me how much care people manage to actually show mm -hmm. their students given the kinds of pressures that they're under. Um, so thank you. Mm -hmm. It is incredibly time consuming. Yeah. Um, but you do have to be able to be at that point where, you, where you're able to make that choice. Mm -hmm. And that's 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 where the system really fails, because it's, mm -hmm. it gets left to individuals to somehow adjust for the system. And it's a systemic problem, not an individual one. Mm. Yeah, I agree with that, Laura. And thank you all. Um, the, the word dialectic was mentioned in the comments, and I think um, even with those intentions that Laura and I had, the, the book would not have happened as it did unless people met us in a particular place. So it was a relationship that we had. So you know, that permission would be nothing unless people brought creativity and courage 
to the project to, you know, to say the difficult things like Robin said. And a lot of, you know, as with any project like this, a lot of lovely coincidences happen. So Robin, for example, wrote about um, a book written by Eddie Glaude called Begin Again about the writings of James Baldwin, which I had finished a few months previously and just was bowled over by and has affected my work quite a bit. And, you know, Eddie, he, he, Eddie Glaude uses this concept of the aftertimes that James Baldwin was writing in a time of moral reckoning in you know the late 60s, early 70s, his later writing um, in, in what was called an aftertime. So, sorry, there's a little feedback there. And that we're living through another aftertimes now and we can refuse to adjust to the status quo and accommodate the status quo and he uses this lovely phrase, which is that we can stand askance to the way things are. Mm. So, so Laura and I set that intention and every single person who wrote for the book did that as well. To stand askance at the way things are, no matter how difficult they are, but just to imagine you know, better possible futures. And they varied because the authors are so diverse, but so we thank all the authors for, for standing askance as we did. That was, that was actually not only a wonderful thing to say, but also they anticipated one of the questions I was going to ask. Um, so you, you, you've addressed that very, very nicely. Um, Carolyn and Jim, thank you both for contributing to Carolyn. Are you Carolyn Kuhn who wrote for the book? Yeah, I am Carolyn Kuhn. Yes. Good. Excellent. Um, so you can find both of their chapters in the book. And by the way, the, you can download the entire thing as a PDF. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so free. you can do it right now. Um, and, uh, and thank you both. Here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to boot you both from the stage right now to make some room for some other folks. But thank you. Thank you very much. Will you mute us? Because I'm not sure where I can mute myself. Um, it's okay. Um, I'm just going to actually just kick you off the stage. So you want to Yeah, worry great. About. Thank you. So this is the, uh, um, this is the, uh, the, the time when um, we not only have dogs, um, but we also have uh, more and more questions. So the, I guess while, while Laura is fending off um, uh, the canine world, um, I, I do have one question uh, to put to you, Catherine. If you could say more about how your authors were able to imagine um, a different future. And the, re the reason for my question is not just professional envy, um, but, but also because so many academics that I, that I listen to and talk with are very, um, what's a good word? I, I don't mean conservative in a political sense, but what they see, they feel themselves under attack. And what they want to do is conserve and preserve what they have, I mean, their particular corner of the higher education space. So they might be a, a historian, they might be a biologist, they might be a librarian. And what they want to do is not think into something new or different. What they want to do is hold on to what they've got against whatever pressures are against them. Now, I'm, I'm curious, what are some of the ways that your authors and the two of you as editors were able to break free of that. How were you? What are some of the mental routes you took to create such different futures? Well, I, I'll start, and then I'll hand over to Laura. Um, one phrase that you'll see in a number of the chapters is came from our invitation for proposals, and that is we invited people to share. Um, glimmers of alternative futures. And that seemed to be a spark for a lot of writers. You know? So we made it really clear that yes, we were inviting analytical work and uh, you know, exploration of the current challenges and, and problems of higher education and beyond. But we also said in the call for chapters that we were inspired by work in other areas. So we weren't just talking about work in higher education. We were inspired by work in areas of climate justice and social justice, where people were using speculative approaches. We invited people to write in different genres. We tried to really smudge some of those, you know, really strict boundaries of academic writing that we're all, you know, posed with. So we invited people to write in the form of poetry or dialogues or. Uh, fiction. Or, um, we invited work from artists to address the themes of the book. So that invitation is, seemed to, you know, to allow people to step out into a different space. You know, it wasn't just another journal article, or you know, which are required obviously from from many people in higher education, but it was just a different way of thinking and and sharing um, that process of thinking. So 
I think that was part of why people felt a little bit freer to do that. I don't know what you think, Laura. I didn't quite catch the question because I was dealing with the dog, but the, the actual dog is, is a real dog. dog. Is the dog happy and safe? <laughs> the dog is very fine. Oh, um, the dog was stuck was stuck under a bush and couldn't get out. Oh no! <laughs> oh, no. Um, but I, uh, what I what I did want to say though is. Uh, well, there are two things I wanted to say, and I'm not sure if they link to what you were asking, but the one thing is that Catherine and I thought a lot about this notion of community, and we started thinking that actually we wanted to talk about coalitions rather than community, although, of course, the kind of community that we found that the book created was an important community. But there was a recognition that uh, what everyone is doing is political. And we wanted to capture that. And the other thing that that was is relevant to is that we are so mindful of the kind of washing that's going on in higher education at the moment, the open washing and the equity washing and the green washing and the appropriation of terminology that we would have previously been able to assume um, signaled a set of values and now because those have been so mainstreamed or taken over we can't assume anymore and that, that was a really important part of this process that we that we wanted to to make clear and to enable well thank you thank you that that actually is a really really good answer both of you thank you this is something i think you've you've just laid out in your book explicated and exemplified um, some really, really powerful ways of being able to think uh, of alternative futures, especially in the face of, of so many challenges. Um, we have, speaking of alternative futures, I want to bring uh, on board uh, another uh, guest. Um, this is George Station, who is coming to you from a massive university system-wide strike. Um, so just let you know, I'm glad that we can have him here and he's, uh, um, he's safe and sound. This is our dear friend, George Station, coming to us from California State University, Monterey Bay. Hello, sir. Um, hi there. And uh, am I coming through on audio? Okay. Beautiful. Yes, yes. Oh, great. Thank you. And hello, everyone. So glad to see everyone, including our other uh, folks who have already been on and the folks in the chat and so on. It's, it's a family reunion, which I think I mentioned <laughs> in the chat, of sorts, of sorts. Um, but um, I, I want to... Uh, First, I want to uh, thank you both for the book, of course, but I want to thank Catherine for mentioning Eddie Cloud specifically. Uh, that specific book has been on my short list for too long. And this allows me to bring it back up because I'm actually starting my semester uh, with a uh, Baldwin reading the uh, author teachers from for the 60s there. And so that allows me a, kind of an excuse to bring uh, a more current reading of Baldwin into the class as well. Uh, uh, it's on uh, teaching for social change. And, uh, um, I, but my question and the reason I wanted to come up besides saying hi is uh, uh, I note that you kind of mentioned, and if you could both say more about, uh, I'll call it the generational issue, because um, you were both talking about stepping back from active teaching and, and, and work in different ways. Uh, Jim mentioned it, uh, Jim Luke mentioned it in another way. Uh, uh, and I'm wondering if you could say more about that aspect of um, doing higher education for good and having to be at a certain career stage to even be able to dive in as deeply as uh, um, you and some of the co-authors did uh, 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 to be at a certain seniority, uh, like, you know, Robin's done doing multiple things uh, very actively in the League of New Hampshire right now. Uh, um, I'm in second career. I've been a lecturer, even though I'm a lecturer and not tenured faculty, I've been doing this a long time, uh, a couple of decades, and I've got a feel for what I want to be doing in the higher education space. Um, but where is the next, where are we going to make space for the next generation? How are we going to do that? Uh, our volumes two and three, should we find more grad students? Uh, what what can we do about that as we are 
uh, I'm going to say we have our generational vision, but we also have a certain amount of generational power that we may be giving up that could actually influence higher education. Hmm. Hmm. So that's my kind of global question. Wow. Oh, wow. In the, in the chat, uh, uh, Glenn McGee uh, notes that the problem of generations is huge in the sociology of knowledge. Yeah. Thank you for that, Glenn. All right. Catherine uh, and well, Laura, do, do, you want to, do you want to respond to uh, George's really thoughtful comment? Um, I can start, Laura. Is that okay? I'm, I, I, yeah, mean, yeah. I can see your thinking. <laughs> <laughs> we know each other very well. <laughs> Um, a few things are going through my mind, George. One is, um, yes, we we are in we are in a particular place in our careers. You know, we, we've we've been through lots of different stages. I was um, precarious employment in higher education for many years, and then permanent, and then you know, local, and then national. So we're in this particular place. It has affordances, and we could have just written, you know, decided to spend two years writing. A book the two of us but that's not what we wanted to do we wanted to you know this whole notion of a community and the co forging a coalition was really important to us and we intentionally invited not just a diversity of authors from global north global south you know many many different countries but we really wanted people at different stages of their careers so there is you know there are chapters written by graduate students you know, one, one brilliant chapter written by four graduate students from the University of Cape Town um, who were working as technology advisors during the pandemic, you know, helping lecturers to implement UDL in their courses. And they looked at UDL from a global South perspective and said, huh, this is one definition of access that we can improve, but maybe we could stretch this a little bit because there's some things that are not included in this particular definition of access. So some really, wonderful examples of you know people in early stages of the career or on the margins in other ways you know using you know putting two different lenses or three different lenses together and generating really exciting important work so we offered mentoring we we stated that in our invitation you know we knew a lot of the problems that you're talking about so we tried to get out in front of that and said don't be dismayed you know if you're early career or a student you know we'll offer mentoring some of that was from ourselves some of that we were able to um, get other scholars to do and I think it makes the book a lot better you know it's really really you know there are students graduate students learning technologists lecturers you know senior academics as, as a whole range even someone who's not working in higher education but has important opinions about it so that's maybe part way to answer the question Laura um, just one other thing about the book is we we also uh, intentionally decided that the last word had to go to the next generation. Mm. So Georgi mm. Arori is a PhD student in India looking at the economics of education. And, you know, that's also part of the baton sharing. Just by the way, I'm not suggesting that we, I or we don't have anything to contribute. That's not the logic. The logic is actually taking, I, I feel like we have a lot to contribute intellectually and in other ways. The logic is actually acknowledging the systemic crisis for younger academics or people trying to get into academia at the moment in almost every place where it's a, you know, we, we all know the stories of people doing four different jobs in four different places on contracts, you know, the numbers of contracts. And we've looked at the figures in just about every country in the world. So mm. when, when we say that, we don't mean like we, we've run out of ideas. I, I feel like we're both bursting with ideas. It's actually how does one, um, how does one confront the crisis in academia? And I, I suppose my hope is that it's like this pendulum that eventually the, the realization will hit systemically that neoliberalism doesn't work for knowledge production and there will be some pushback. And, and part of this work that we're all doing and that the authors are doing will be part of that pushback and they will actually write things um, so that so that that kind of thinking systemically isn't needed in the same way because there's so much to be done and and if you look at the issues that brian's raised in these in his various forums 
there is so much to be done and there's so much for people in academia to do in terms of sense making and we need this this whole generation this, these postgraduate students some of us it's our children you know it's it's really important yeah thank you so, yeah uh, and uh, thank you laura and um uh Catherine, for your response too, because you're actually helping rewrite the syllabus for my other class now, which is uh, with teacher ed students teaching and learning with technology. And so um, um, you both rightly disabused me of the idea. Uh, uh, so I uh, uh, seeing the book in a certain way. So now I get to rethink and dive back in because obviously I haven't, you know, uh, uh, a, a lot of us and I, you know, I haven't read the book yet, right? I'm just like, I'm looking to read it. And so now I know better about the contributions, but the uh, chapter uh, by grad students on UDL in the Global South uh, can immediately go into to my teaching and learning uh, with technology class because of the limits of, I'm going to say, generic UDL, uh, Universal Design for Learning. Mm -hmm. um, and I uh, brought in, uh, started to bring in a, an anti-racism lens uh, last semester uh, because of a particular book uh, because I think there's only a book or two now that specifically talks about anti-racism in UDL. And, and um, um, I think the chapter that Catherine mentioned is going to kind of flesh out the rest of my uh, rapidly being revised syllabus. Uh, that's the other thing uh, that's happening this week across uh, uh, the CSU, across Cal State, uh, because of the very short uh, one-day strike. Uh, we were thrown back into our classes a few days uh, more quickly than most of us thought we would ah, ah. and so um in about 10 minutes uh i've got my next class period so thank you so much uh brian george george and, just to it. mention there's also a book on why decolonization hmm. is important for teaching and learning great yes, yes indeed. there's also a chapter that that uh, will be valuable for your whole curriculum too i suspect great, great. thank you okay so your book's uh, obviously going on the syllabus in about 10 minutes thank you george <laughs> our, our work here is done okay Open and, access. Uh, i think i think jim has uh, got uh, i he uh, said he had something to uh, uh, yeah. uh, add to something i i said earlier and i i, I knew it kind of knew it was coming because I, I know uh, uh, Jim well. That sounds terrifying. <laughs> and so now I knew yeah, I'm, I'm going to take myself, uh, or if, uh, if you can excuse me from the stage and let uh, uh, Jim back in, that would be great. Uh, thanks, thanks, folks. Thank great you, George. Good luck. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to, to react to uh, a, an earlier part of, of George's comment. And he, he talked about in some of the discussion there, you know, he's talking about like obviously getting at the age or stage of career of some of us as authors, and then and uh, as, as Laura and Catherine brought up, and then there were the younger ones that were innovative, and I I think and somebody else I don't know if it was George mentioned you know well well how do we produce you know where's it going to come from for you know volume two of higher ed for good or something like that and so you know what i'm not at all worried about that um because you know as part of the research for the chapter i wrote i had I, I did a fair amount of study of you know in that way that only an economist can uh have, think they have the guts to summarize the entire history of higher ed across cultures you know in a few pages um i looked at it and Really, the, you know, the essence of higher ed, adult education beyond the basics, has always been this multiple intergenerational thing. That's what we're about. And it, you know, we've lost sight and gotten distracted ourselves in our last couple of generations into thinking that everything is about these things, these books, and these documents, and these courses and actually now we think of a course is actually being a bunch of content uh, you know written down in fact it's always been a bunch of folks that have gotten to an elder stage of their life with a mm. lot of deep knowledge and they're passing it on whether they're doing that by publishing research and new insights that they've learned or they're doing it by face-to-face -face and teaching they're passing it on and at the same time having a dialogue 
with these newcomers or these young ones or other folks that have a different perspective and you got some, oh, and then from that, we get more and we get people in the middle of their career going, yeah, this is fascinating. I really need to learn more. And that's what they do. And they do it. And so that's been going on for a couple of millennia uh, or more. Mm -hmm. And I'm not at all worried about that continuing to go on. What I am concerned about is whether or not our current institutional structures facilitate that as well as they might. And I think we're getting a little bit, and that's why, you know, the concern about austerity and all that other kind of stuff. But, you know, I'm also aware that institutional structures can change. I mean, what you call, would have called higher education in, uh, in China um, 800 years ago didn't look like a university today, but it was effectively doing the same thing. So I'm not worried about it. I think we need to focus on the essence of higher ed is in fact all these dialogues, all this passing on of what, oh, I learned this or that. Now you can know it so you can learn more. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's really, really well said. We, Laura, uh, Catherine and Jim, we have two juicy questions coming in, and I, I want to make sure that, that we get a chance to handle them. Um, and thank you, Jim, for, for chiming in. I, I love the path that you all have taken uh, um, with George's uh, vector there about, about generations. This is a, a question here. And Jim, let me give you a, a chance to climb off the stage here. This is a, a question from uh, Yaprak Dalit Ward, and I hope I've not completely destroyed your name. Um, and he uh, asks, um, the Wall Street Journal essay, Why Americans Have Lost Faith in the Value of College, indicated U.S. college is all, college for all is broken. How do we move forward regarding higher education for good? You want me to put that back on the screen again? I suppose the, the thing that we, we, we've written about and one must emphasize is that higher education it doesn't exist in a vacuum. Higher education is part of a broader social system. And so we're not going to be able to fix higher education if we don't fix the, the way our societies are structured at the moment, which I think is why neoliberalism has, was such a thread through the book. It wasn't one we asked for. In fact, we asked for people to talk about climate change and growing trees, and we got neoliberalism instead. <laughs> So, so higher education is an echo and a reflection of broader social problems. Where it's unique is its opportunity to also shape society. Um, because of the fact that it's a knowledge working space. It's a bit terrifying that much of the knowledge work is now happening inside Google and, you know, big tech companies. But that mm -hmm. is what, what, what has to be clung to is the fact that it is the responsibility of universities to shape change and to think differently. But it can't do it in isolation. Yeah. I agree with that completely, Laura. Um, and we haven't mentioned this yet. It's five minutes to the hour and we haven't mentioned the manifesto. <laughs> But what, one of the things that Laura and I did after these chapters were written and having been so close to them was to look across them as diverse as they are in so many respects and see if there were threads that you know, could, could connect them that would, would address the question that you just posed. And the, we, we not definitively calling it a manifesto, the language we use in the book is towards a manifesto. And that's a nod to just the diversity of context that we all find ourselves in and higher education in different countries and areas and roles and so on. And the, the five um, tenets of the manifesto are like Robin started us off with naming and analyzing the troubles of higher education. You know, we quote Miranda Fricker who says, you know, in her work on epistemic justice says we must study injustice first because the negative imprint reveals the value of the positive. Um, quality. So naming and analyzing and digging in 
to the troubles of HE is essential. As Laura says, it's connected to so much else. The second tenet is challenging assumptions and resisting hegemonies. Um, the third one is making claims for just, humane and globally sustainable higher education. So digging into the dirt and naming and analyzing and challenging and then banner, you know, what are we working towards? And again, that's borrowing from movements for social justice and social change as well. Mm. The fourth one is imagining and sharing possibilities for change. And the fifth one is making positive change, even if it's small scale in a classroom. Um, and recognizing the power, as Laura said already, of coalition, that we can do this in our various locations and ways and, you know, whether it's structural or individual or pedagogy or content or policy. Um, but, you know, these five tenets we think are, you know, when we look at any issue that we're addressing, we think it's a, it's a really good way of thinking through and identifying paths for action and change. Thank you. And that's all thanks to the authors, we have to say. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you both for those for those really sweet answers to um, uh, Professor Ward. What a great question. Uh, one quick question for everybody in the chat. Um, uh, we've had a couple of requests to uh, copy the chat and, uh, uh, and post it up to a blog post. Uh, I'll do this by uh, anonymizing some light editing. Any objections, please let me know in the chat. Um, Here's a, here's a question that follows up on, on the previous one, Catherine and Laura. Uh, and this is from uh, our good friend, Kiel uh, Dumsch, who asks, um, in his view, it's the out of control price of college, particularly here in the US, that's the biggest thing that needs fixing about higher ed. Part of this is caused by employer degree mandates, which have granted the higher ed near monopoly and job credentialing, that is now starting to change. I would like Laura and Catherine's view on this topic. So that's, that's starting off with the question of higher education prices spiraling up, and that ends with the question of, of, of breaking up the, uh, the role that higher education has on um, job credentialing. I'm going to say one sentence and hand over to Laura, and that's to read Robin's chapter. <laughs> and that's not just a pithy response. It's, there's, yeah, yeah. So much, there's so that's much good. in there about this. Yeah, no, and I would agree because as Robin said herself, when she started writing, she was writing about the US and we really encouraged her to think about how these particular issues play out in different contexts and what the um, underlying principles that uh, join these different contexts together and what, what's distinct in, in different places. Um, so the, the US, I learned a lot about the US from this process because it's quite unique like that. in, the, in that sense. Yes. Um, and there are places where, in theory, higher education is free, where there are still massive problems because, as we know, you know, neoliberalism is not just um, structural, it's, it's also a mental process and it's also um, practices being being brought into organizations. So it's not a purely economic model. It's it's endogenous and exogenous. Mm. So that's a really that's a really big question to ask right at the end. So I think Robin really does provide an, an excellent overview about how these different principles play out in different places. Well, thank you. Thank you both uh, for the answer to the question. Thank you, Kiel, as ever, for the thoughtful uh, for the thoughtful question, and um, and thanks to Robin for providing um, a passionately written, thoughtful answer. Um, I guess we are at the very end of, of our time, and I, I just want to read from the the last chapter in the book. Um, these are the last. Uh, this is really the last sentence of it. Uh, Let's continue striving with such endeavors with even more vigor. Let's continue shaking the universe of higher education through our ideas and the power of words to explore more pathways towards higher education for good. So I think that's a beautiful, beautiful way to, to end both that volume from uh, Jyoti Aurora and also our hour today. Laura, Catherine, how can people keep up with you? What's the best way to find out uh, what you're up to next? It's sad. It used to. I want. We used to be able to say on Twitter, but no longer. 
Um, so instead of Twitter. CatherineCronin.net is my website and that's got all my contact details on it and all else. Oh, good. Oh, good. Well, I'm doing that old fashioned, I'm doing that old fashioned thing of putting a, an email address down. That works. That works. <laughs> um, well, old fashioned, the new, uh, all kinds of changes and features are open here. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Catherine, for helping bring together this extraordinary book and an extraordinary community. This is really, really important. I hope everyone gets a chance to read this soon. Thank you both. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the chat has been amazing. It's been hard to keep up, but um, just amazing conversation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. But don't go away yet, folks. Even though this is uh, uh, a parts of a few, some of us are experiencing uh, nighttime. Uh, let me just um, thank everybody for your questions, for your comments, and let me just point out where things are headed next. Um, so, if you'd uh, like to keep up with the forum, if you'd like to keep talking about these issues, uh, here is me across all the social media with the hashtag FTTE. You can find me on Threads, Blue Sky, Mastodon, and Twitter, uh, as well as on my blog. Uh, if you'd like to go into our back sections and take a look at previous sessions talking about some of these topics, everything from accreditation and cost to visioning the future, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Uh, if you'd like to look at our upcoming sessions on a whole variety of topics, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us. In the meantime, thank you all for all this conversation. This has been a terrific time. I'm grateful to you putting up with me coming through from a uh, foggy time where it's almost the 26th. Um, I hope everybody is well, safe, and sound. We'll see you next Thursday. Take care. Bye-bye.